Hi, and welcome to Policy Matters. This is a radio program on WELT that is sponsored by the League of Women Voters. Uh, we monthly talk about different topics uh, relating to public policy issues, um, and this time we're going to talk about voter registration. Uh, voter Registration Day at the national level, there's a national Voter Reg Registration Day, is uh, September 24th, and we try um, nationwide to get people to focus on voter registration um, by registering people to vote and talking about voter registration on that particular day um, as a nation um, annually for the last um, many years. Uh, Indiana doesn't have an election this year. Uh, this is a non-election year. So everybody is gearing up for the next election cycle in 2018. Um, so sometimes people may feel like that's this is not an important topic since there's not an election this year. But I would argue that it, it is. Um, and election issues happen all of the time. Um, just yesterday, there was a lawsuit filed against um, the state of Indiana to um, uh, affect the uh, way that voter registration polls are purged. Uh, so for example, um, people who have moved um, and maybe are, are, have registered in Indiana and also maybe registered in another state, there's a uh, cross check, which is a good thing, uh, to make sure that people are not registered in both, both places. Um, historically, uh, that the, if that was um, discovered, people would be given an opportunity to respond to that and take care of that. Um, Senate Bill 40, 442 uh, that just went into effect in July of this year would allow the state to purge those records as a result of the cross-check without notifying um, the uh, voter. Um, so that would make it um, possible for you to be uh, to think you were registered and then find out later that you were not. So um, topical issue of the day um, as of uh, yesterday um, uh, and you know, as of July this was a new rule that went into place and then as of yesterday uh, that rule has been challenged. So um, it's, a, it's a good time to talk about voter registration and so in order to do that um, more effectively I've invited Doug Schmidt who's the Director of Communications of Fifth Freedom to come and join us this, um, for this show um, that we'll be running in September during Voter Registration Day month. Um, and uh, uh, Doug has um, brought along a lot of good Im information that is specific to um, voter registration as it relates to disability rights and um, access to the polls and uh, making sure that people um, have uh, the ability to, to uh, um, express their, their uh, vote um, when it is time to, to do that. Uh, so that's what we're going to spend the time talking about uh, today. The League of Women Voters has partnered with Fifth Freedom on multiple occasions on mm -hmm. voter registration. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those uh, opportunities is Voter Registration Day. Uh, last year, Fifth Freedom had um, provided onboard um, registration on CityLink buses. Um, and I don't know of anybody that has done that before. I think that is very cool. Um, they've used tablets and hotspots, and it was very high-tech. Um, we also had kind of a low-tech version on um, at um, available at uh, the CityLink Central Station for people that could um, also register the, with the paper ballot uh, or paper uh, vo voter registration forms. Um, and um, distributed some of those on the bus, too. Um, but it was really neat to be able to have people check their voter registration status real time. Um, and you can do that very easily at home. Um, at now, you know, while you're listening to us, uh, go to <laughs> indianavoters.com and check your voter registration um, and make sure that it, the address is current 
and that you have um, all of the correct information um, and that it's there that hasn't been purged without your knowledge. Um, and, uh, and then check it again uh, before you go vote. Um, mm. You need t- to register to vote um, well in a month in advance of, mm-hmm. uh, of the, the next voting cycle. So you'll probably want to mark your calendar f- for 2018 in uh, like August or so um, and make sure that uh, you check again and make sure that that voter registration is still up to date. Um, okay, so enough enough about me um, <laughs> and, and what I want to tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll talk some more. Um, but let's let Doug talk a little bit about um, uh, voter registration day and this ride to register uh, option that um, Fifth Freedom focused on uh, last year and we're and we're doing again. Okay, uh, yeah, the right ride to register, like you said, I've I've never heard anyone else doing this. Um, I I think we might be the first, and I I've put together a document about how we did the project and all of the requirements and everything, and I hope I hope other people, other organizations around the country, kind of copy uh, this project because I think it's just so valuable. Not only you know registering people to vote, but to target that audience of public transit riders who who aren't necessarily, you know, the most the most likely to be registered. Do we wanna do we wanna talk about the technical requirements or is that going to bore people? <laughs> yeah, well I, I like I like the technical requirements because mm-hmm. I think it's um that's what makes it work. I think that that real time ability to to do it while you've got mm-hmm. somebody captured. Obviously, if somebody's going to be getting off the bus right away, they might not want to sit there with you. But they've got a few minutes, then they don't really have anything better to do. Uh, it's a it's a good opportunity to do that. I will mention that if it is not already um, up there, we will put it on the League of Women Voters website. This document that Doug referenced. It's on the it will be if it's not already on the League of Women Voters Fort Wayne website. So that's lwvfw.org. We we will put this show up there as well um, mm. when we get it uh, turned into a YouTube video, and then we'll post the show. And but we'll make sure that we'll have that document for reference too. So if you you don't need to take a lot of notes now, you'll have uh, you'll if you're interested in learning how to replicate that uh, program in other communities, or if you want to be mm-hmm. part of the one that's going to be happening here on uh, Voter Registration Day, you can uh, get uh, involved through the League of Women Voters website. So the the first thing that we wanted to plan for was the internet connection, and uh, obviously the bus doesn't have its own Wi-Fi, or at least most buses. I'm sure there's some high-tech bus out there somewhere with its own Wi-Fi. Most people, uh, a lot of people, they'll have you know, a smartphone or access to a smartphone, but that can be a bit small for people that, you know, have vision issues or, or other, you know, sensory issues that smartphones can be a bit small and aren't necessarily the most accessible. So you need some sort of way to get mobile internet or uh, what what we prefer to use is a mobile hotspot, which is just a little box that provides its own own mobile internet connection and creates a Wi-Fi connection on the bus. Once you get, uh, once you do some research and determine which hotspot will kind of work best for you, um, one, one of the things that you want to determine is, well, how long are you going to be on the bus? You want to make sure you have enough battery life to be, you know, to be there on the bus all day if you're going to be doing a day-long project. Um, you want to determine, you know, do you need battery backups? Do you have, you know, a way you have a way to plug this in, you know, to an extra battery if you need that. So, and then once you get the once you get the mobile hotspot set up, you want to well, you want to do that before you get on the bus because it's going to be a lot easier to do that at the bus stop than than on the bus while you're bouncing around. Uh, you want to make sure you know your tablet and everything's ready to go, and that you've got your website uh, IndianaVoters.com already pulled up and ready to go then you want to make sure that you have your Wi-Fi password protected so that your team, you or your team, are the only ones that can access it. The mobile hotspots don't, they don't have a lot of bandwidth. And so if somebody else on the bus decides they want to watch YouTube on your connection, (laughs) that's going to be a problem. You want to make sure they can't do that. So the next thing to plan, plan ahead is 
you want to make sure you talk to the public transit authority, you know, that they, they know who you are, they know what day you're coming, they're okay with you doing it. You know, so um, maybe like having a name badge or a T-shirt or something mm-hmm. like that is a good idea so that um, all of the different people that, you know, the drivers and stuff like that can identify that you're part of the, that group. Exactly. Uh, some, some transit authorities, they may, want to, they may want to provide you with, you know, a transit authority T-shirt or a badge or something. Right. But uh, if they don't do that, you definitely want to have your own. Right. You know, it also um, lets people, it makes you look professional. You know, you're not just some guy walking up to a stranger. You're right. officially representing right. an organization. Are you registered to vote? See me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can help. Right. Yeah. So you, you, you want to look official. Um, you, also, uh, you also want to talk to your team about what you can and cannot say. Assuming you're, assuming you're working with a nonprofit or some other you know, volunteer organization like that, if you're a 501c3 or tax exempt, you cannot, absolutely cannot uh, give a preference in favor or against a candidate or any of the ballot questions even if you're just a volunteer and you're not an official representative of the organization, showing any sort of preference one way or the other can get you in a lot of hot water. Uh, in some circumstances, organizations have had their tax exempt status pulled because somebody said they liked one candidate or the other, and so you want to make sure everybody knows not to do that. Sometimes you'll run into uh, you'll run into voters or would-be voters who are very enthusiastic about their particular favorite candidate, and they will try to encourage you. And well, what do you think about this guy, or what do you think about this lady? And you you have to kind of resist the urge. You know, you have to, have to kind of say, no, 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 I can't. You know, I'm here to talk about voting, not who you're voting for. Right, right. Well, and as a um, as a condition of getting permission to do it on the buses, mm-hmm. you would have to require that. You know, the the transit system would require that too. Exactly. I mean, they can't they can't be associated with an organization that is partisan. Sure, sure. Um, so you definitely, you want to make sure you know, you know, uh, you want to make sure everybody knows that you're there, that you're looking as official and professional as possible. You also want to have paper paper ballots as a backup in case your technology goes down. And also, like you mentioned, if people are getting off at their next stop and you know they're not going to be there long enough to fill it out, you want to be able to give the paper copy off to people. Or if people just, you know, they're afraid of technology, they don't want to mess with your tablet, you, know, you can give them the paper. So have, you know, clipboards ready, pens ready. Uh, be prepared to give away your pens if, if, <laughs> if it gets people to register to vote. Let them take the pen with them, that's fine. Right. So um, also, when people are when people are on the bus, especially if it's an early route, be prepared for people to say, "No, no, no! I'm just I'm just here going to work. I don't want to talk to anybody." Or if people avoid eye contact with you, don't you know? Don't bother people that are on the bus. You know, wait for people to make eye contact with you and give some indication that they want to talk with you. If people give any indication, you know, oh, I'm I'm tired. I'm you know. Maybe had a late night last night. <laughs> you know, let people be. You you definitely want to um, present your organization and voting issues in the best possible way. And that also, you know, let people go. You know, never never stand in people's way <laughs> if they're trying to get off the bus. Right, right. Yeah, you don't want to block the aisles or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. So the so the really cool thing about this too is that it these tablets. Um, work in any remote location. So Mm -hmm. we talk about doing it on the bus, which is sort of um, the ultimate remote location in that Mm -hmm. respect that it's moving and, uh, you know, it has uh, connectivity things. I just, you know, you wouldn't have even thought that that would even be possible. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, But that same technology works um, at... uh, uh, booths and, mm-hmm. and and events and that sort of thing. So, League of Women Voters just used that same tablet technology to register people to vote and, and, and to look up the status of their voter registration at Taste mm-hmm. of the Arts last weekend. So, we had a table um, there and, and uh, we all took turns um, manning, womaning that table. <laughs> um, and uh, the um, couple hours that I was there, um, we we had some connectivity issues, I must say, but we got it to work, um, and 
it, that was pretty neat to be able to mm-hmm. to look up people's uh, registration status on the spot. Um, and that was a good location for it because people were just sort of meandering around anyway. Mm-hmm. They didn't really have any place that they were supposed to be. Um, so they were willing to spend another three or four minutes um, or whatever it took uh, it to... Uh, to, to take care of that, um, and uh, it was enabled. You know, it, it enabled us to draw them in and talk about other issues that the League of Women Voters was interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, again, nonpartisan because we, sure. as League of Women Voters, cannot take a stand on any particular candidate. Um, but we can certainly take a stand on issues, and so one of the issues that we we're focusing on was voter registration. Mm-hmm. Um, also, we're focusing on redistricting, which is another conversation altogether that we won't really get into, but we have some opportunities to um, talk further about that um, coming up, and I'll, mm-hmm. I'll try and remember to mention those closer to the end of the show, but uh, there's a, um, an advocacy workshop coming up on uh, November, um, what did I say, 4th, um, that is uh, um, at Beacon Heights um, yeah, Presbyte- uh, Beacon Heights uh, Church of the Brethren uh, from 9 to noon. Um, and uh, so there'll be some citizen advocacy training uh, sponsored by Common Cause, League of Women Voters, and uh, People for the Common Good. And um, we can certainly talk about voter registration as, as a advocacy uh, opportunity, but uh, um, there are many... Um, ab- things that you good advocacy tools can certainly um, be helpful for, and and so mm-hmm. uh, that that I'll just put that plug in now. Try <laughs> and remember to mention it again later, uh, so that uh, you can get that uh, information. And it, and at any time, if you want to get more information about the things that we're talking about, again, the League of Women Voters uh, Fort Wayne website. Uh, there's also a Facebook page. Um, Mm -hmm. There's also an email list that you can get on um, by linking to that, and um, and all of this information will be available there as well. So you'll have plenty of uh, chance to to be reminded of uh, the things that we've talked about if you're you're interested in doing that. Um, So... We're anything else we want to talk about about the I, I kind of cut you off on the on the re, um, voter registration mobile voter mm-hmm. registration system how does how that works oh another another thing if you're a nonprofit or volunteering for a nonprofit um, Indiana law states that you cannot offer rewards for registering to vote mm. so if you set up a table with candy or balloons or or some such thing to give away to people registering to vote. You have to make it clear that all of these goodies are for everybody, regardless of whether you're a registered voter or not. Right. Generally, people won't take advantage of you and just take a balloon without registering or talking to you. Right. Um, so if you're going to give away your pen, you've mm-hmm. got to give away your pen to everybody. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, when, people, when people do say that they're already registered, which a lot of people will, you know, it's important to remind people, well, if you've moved to a new district, you need to re-register. If you've gotten married and changed your name, you need to re-register. If you think you might have been subject to the voter purge, you need to check check into that and, and re-register. So there's there's lots of reasons to to check your check your registration and make sure everything's up to date. Right. Well, and I've noticed t- I mean, like our the. Um, one of the ladies at the League of Women Voters had mentioned that uh, she has a hyphenated name. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, for whatever reason, she went to, you know, she's been voting her entire life and, you know, is mm-hmm. obviously a very active um, person in in terms of uh, League of Women Voters and, and, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, knows how to do all of these things. So she checked. And um, even though she'd been registered here in Fort Wayne for many, many years, um, somehow or another, her registration got changed, and so instead of her name, her last name being hyphenated, um, her the first part of her last name was put in the middle name status, <laughs> and so um, it it wouldn't have matched mm-hmm. uh, with her ID that she was bringing. Mm-hmm. So um, so that's you know even watching for those kinds of things, even though you think that you're. It, registration is absolutely correct and haven't had any trouble before mm-hmm. um, as they go through and update 
the voter registration information, um, sometimes um, they, you know, an error can be introduced into the mm -hmm. record that wasn't there previously. Um, so you, you just never quite, quite know until you check um, for sure. Um, so, so there'll be some, you know, plenty of opportunities. Uh, League of Women Voters are using these tablets um, a variety of different places. Uh, like I said, Taste of the Arts was one. Mm -hmm. um, they are going to be at Middle Waves. Um, let's see, whenever this, yes, I, th I don't think that will have happened yet before this airs. Um, and uh, if you have an event um, that, that you're aware of or you have a location um, that you would like Legal Women Voters or, or Fifth Freedom or any other mm -hmm. organization to come and help you register voters, um, let us know. Uh, mm -hmm. Send us an email. Again, you can do that through the website. And, um, and we will do our best to try and get some volunteers to come and do that. Uh, certainly, Voter Registration Day, we're trying to get a variety of different places. I think they're going to do registration in addition to on the buses um, at Wondercomer uh, down on the south side. At IPFW Library, I think, is going to be mm -hmm. having a voter registration for students. Um, so um, if there's, e you know, in, a, in conjunction with Voter Registration Day or any time um, in the next, you know, forever, um, <laughs> you, uh, you can think of an organization. And it can happen at churches. I think that's <laughs> one of the things that people oftentimes feel, uh, again, need to be nonpartisan, and that, mm -hmm. that is true. Um, but certainly a voter registration can happen um, um, just about anywhere mm -hmm. uh, in, in the community that is willing to host that. So, um, you know, like you know, we could set up a table in front of a grocery store or we could mm -hmm. set up a table um, um, and coffee hour at your church on Sunday morning or Saturday morning or whenever you, mm -hmm. you worship. Um, so in anywhere, anytime um, that can happen from a, uh, an, um, you know, if you need uh, some assistance. Um, but um, uh, at indianavoters.com, you can do it your own self, all by yourself, mm -hmm. um, and you can encourage other people to do it all by themselves anytime. 24-7, mm -hmm. even on holidays, any anytime, anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there's also an app for that, of course, because there's an app for everything. Um, IndianaVoters.com has an app for your cell phone. They've got um, the website. And um, so I would encourage people mm -hmm. to to just do it. Um, it's, it's also good to uh, visit the website or the app. You can look up your polling place. Mm -hmm. Those change... Uh, Kind of often and unexpectedly, uh, a lot of people have talked to us saying they didn't know where their polling place was because there was no notice. It just moved. Right. You can see who your current elected officials are. You can, you know, look up. You can look up your district maps, things like that. So uh, there's a lot, lot of useful tools. Uh, next year, not not now, but next year, you'll be able to look, look and see who's on your ballot and you know local ballot propositions. You know, give yourself time to research the candidates and, you know, research the ballot props if there are any in your area. Right. So I think next year is um, state senate, or uh, there's, uh, let's see, what, what's up next year? It's the um, uh, federal... Um, uh, next, year we, next year we have uh, one Senate seat at the, at the federal level. We have one U.S. Senate seat. Uh -huh. We have... All nine uh, House of Representatives, U.S. House of Representatives, all nine are going up. We have, we have uh, several, you know, state house, state house seats. I believe the uh, the auditor and the treasurer of of the state are also up for re-election as well. Right. So it's a good time to research in case you don't know what the auditor and the treasurer do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a very good question. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, I should never ask questions that I don't know the answer to. So good, good job, Doug. I was like, um, let me look it up on my phone. I don't remember. Um, but, uh, yeah, there, there'll, there'll be some issues, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of considered an off year, I guess, because mm -hmm. there isn't a presidential election. Um, but uh, Indiana... Uh, election, um, uh, the, you know, the percentage of people mm -hmm. who have voted in Indiana has been 
really low the mm-hmm. last couple of, of election cycles, and, and people are really concerned about that. Um, you know, so I think in part that is one of the things that sort of prompted this voter registration purge mm-hmm. idea mm-hmm. is that, you know, if you look at voter uh, part- you know, participation as a percentage of, of uh, people who are registered to vote, obviously, if you have fewer people registered to vote, then your percentages go up, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so keeping the, the polls clean is a good idea in, in theory. Um, but there are federal rules that uh, states must follow in order mm-hmm. to make sure that they are not infringing on people's rights. Um, and, and there's some notification requirements that, and, and that's really what this uh, lawsuit, uh, and I, I guess I didn't mention um, that it was uh, uh, NCAA, N- NAACP um, was the na- named plaintiff, I guess, or in, in mm-hmm. the lawsuit. The Brennan Center for Justice were the ones that have actually filed the lawsuit, and there mm-hmm. was a uh, article um, uh, about that, uh, that that we're referencing here um, that talks about that particular lawsuit. But basically their their um, their idea is is that um, in, you know, one of the examples that they gave is uh, in, in Kansas, I think it is, that um, in 2013, they did a voter purge, and they purged uh, 40, 40,000 registered voters um, prior to a statewide election. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, let's see, um, yeah, even though the local election fi- officials found an error rate as high as 17% um, in their, uh, their cross check. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, according to a 2016 analysis, minorities are more likely than whites uh, to be flagged for removal in these cross checks. And mm-hmm. so um, there's, there's that concern um, as well. So I think that that's why the NAACP is particularly interested in it. But certainly, um, you know, every, everybody wants the, the, you know, the polls or the uh, um, uh, uh, registration rolls to be accurate. Hmm. Um, but but, but uh, one fifth, almost a fifth error rate is far, far too high to be relying on cross check and simply sim- uh, cross check, if I remember correctly, it relies on people's first name, last name and date of birth, which obviously there's a lot of John Smiths mm. out there. Uh, my name's Doug Schmidt, and I know there's I know there's uh, three or four other uh, Doug Schmidts in Indiana. I don't know if they have my same birth date, but I know there's quite a few people with with my name. So it's not a reliable right. thing at all. Well, going back to uh, like a hyphenated last name issue, mm-hmm. that, I mean, it, they could get kicked out just because of that, even. Oh yes, yes. Right, because there's not an exact match, maybe. Yeah. And I think it's uh, I think you only need 180 people in a room for it to be more likely than not for two of them to share the same birthday. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's not really that's not really a reliable thing. Right. Uh, and to me the really the really unusual thing about the bill about uh, SB 442 is there was no there didn't seem to be any denial of well this doesn't actually violate federal rules or you know we can skirt around federal rules this way. All of the discussion about the bill that I looked at, they kind of admitted, well, this isn't. This is a change. You know, this is different than the requirements of the law. If you if you go on to the Indiana State Legislature's website and you look at the kind of fiscal ramifications for the bill, they mentioned that there too. That the uh, I can't remember which office it is that that does the the fiscal ramifications for the bills, but they were kind of aware of that too. Oh, the state but no. Um, the state budget office, uh, something like that. They were legislative they were, service agency. Legis- yes, that's that's correct. Legislative service agency. They were aware too that this wasn't in line with federal rules. That there was just kind of an aside that, yeah, federal rules do require these mailings to go out notifying people, but on the plus side, it'll save money and mailing costs if we don't do the mailings. 
which really doesn't justify the bill. But maybe increase the legal cost by having to argue that you are wanting to violate federal rules. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how that is. Like, well, let's see. You want to give the money to the post office or do you want to give the money to uh, um, lawyers? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Um, I guess that's getting by... Uh, my opinion. We won't go in there. <laughs> we won't go to my opinion. So, um, well, um, you you had mentioned earlier about um, uh, specifically uh, polling places uh, changing, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, so one of the other things that we uh, wanted to, to mention a little bit um, on this show, policy matters, uh, that is uh, um, sponsored by the League of Women Voters on WELT. Um, is uh, <clears throat> uh, access to voting opportunities for people with disabilities. That is mm-hmm. certainly something that le- that uh, Fifth Freedom I- has worked on extensively, and and certainly um, something that everyone should should care about, making sure that everybody mm-hmm. um, has uh, proper access uh, there. And, and, you know, in conjunction with that, we can talk a little bit about early voting and mm-hmm. um, and what other states do um, in terms of being able to vote online and, and you know, mm-hmm. making voting so easy that, you know, you're, you're almost, you can't n- not vote. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's just, it's, it's, it's uh, so easy to do. Um, and, and same thing with registering to vote. I guess that's mm-hmm. another thing we should mention while we're on voter registration. Other communities... Oh, that was the thing, is that um, Illinois um, yesterday uh, just adopted a rule um, that everybody is automatically going to be able to register to vote um, when they go to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles in mm-hmm. Illinois um, to update their licenses um, mm-hmm. or their ID cards if they don't have a driver's license. Um, m- I think... Shoot, that's what I was going to bring. Um, I think there are eight or nine states that have that now where you're just mm-hmm. automatically registered to vote. Uh, you can register to vote at Bureau Motor Vehicles uh, offices in Indiana. Mm-hmm. That is one of the, the voter registration sites um, that is uh, always available to people. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, but you don't have to. Um, but I think in the, the difference in Illinois and other states is that um, basically that's just going to be a concurrent activity that you know they mm-hmm. will that that will happen. So um, you know in in other states they've they've made it so much easier to register to vote mm-hmm. than than they have here in Indiana, and I think that uh, um, I um, you know that's that's certainly. A, an issue. Um, so first of all, you have to be registered, mm-hmm. um, and then you have to vote. So let's talk a little bit about the h- voting part and, and how do you get access to the polls. Sure, sure. Uh, well, for for people with disabilities, uh, no form of disability disqualifies anyone in in Indiana from from voting. Um, a lot of a lot of people they come to us worried that you know their their friend or their relative isn't technically allowed to vote, but anybody uh, regardless of disability is is allowed to vote. Uh, when you go to when you go to a polling place, though, there may be accessibility problems. All polling places nationwide are required to be accessible to people with disabilities, but there's still issues from from time to time. Um, Unfortunately, if you do have a disability and you're not able to get into your polling place, it's illegal for them to bring a ballot out to you. So uh, that's that's something that a lot of people with disabilities have to have to deal with. If you get into the polling place and but you have a disability that might make it difficult for you to use the voting machine, uh, you can designate a friend or a family member to come in to uh, the booth with you and and help you use the machine. If you don't have a friend or a family member who is available, uh, two poll workers, one from each major party, are able to come in with you and assist you with using the machine. Uh, you can designate it, but you can designate anybody to come in and help you, other than your employer or your union representative. Uh, and nobody's legally permitted to tell others how they how you voted. So. 
Accessibility, accessibility issues are a pretty big problem for people with disabilities when it comes to, uh, when it comes to voting. In 2012, 38% of people with disabilities reported that they had physical barriers to getting into their polling place, like a lack of curb cuts or a lack of accessible parking or, you know, doors that were difficult to open, long lines with no seating, that th things like that. Um, in 2009, it was even worse. 73% of people reported accessibility problems. And, not, and it doesn't just affect people from voting once. Uh, a lot of times when people encounter accessibility problems that prevent them from getting into the polling place or casting their vote, they don't want to come back. In a national survey, 40% of people with disabilities who had not voted said that they had run into accessibility problems in the last 10 years. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, people run into accessibility problems and just think, oh, well, voting's more trouble than it's worth, and so they don't come back. And so that's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty big way people end up discouraged. Uh, also, people have accessibility problems with the voting machine. Again, in 2012, around 30% of people with disabilities said that they had trouble using the voting machine. Uh, there's a wide, wide variety of different reasons for that. Either they, you know, the voting machine wasn't accessible or they just didn't know how to operate it or the, you know, poll workers weren't adequately trained on how to use the, the voting machine and demonstrate the voting machine or it wasn't even set up so that they could use the accessible voting machine in, in a handful of cases. So that can, that can prevent people from voting as well. Uh, when, we, when we look at um, accessibility issues with voting, uh, one of the biggest affected groups are actually people with cognitive disabilities. Uh, more, than, more than half of people with cognitive or intellectual disabilities don't vote. And so that's a, that's a very, very widely impacted group. Uh, fortunately, the solution, as far as the voting machine goes, the solution's relatively simple. It only takes about five minutes for most people to, uh, you know, to see a voting machine demonstrated and and to figure it out. And, you know, organizations can go down can go down to uh, the they can call the Indiana Election Division. They can ask to borrow a voting machine and demonstrate it for groups. If you call the election division and you ask which machines used in your in your county, you can look up on YouTube. You can see video demonstrations of, you know, like the microvote, the acre, whichever machines used in in your area. You can see that on YouTube. So it doesn't really take that long to to kind of get that that experience. You just just need to do it before <laughs> before you've got the pressure, you know, on right. there at, at the at the polling day. Well, this would be a good time to do that, really, I guess. I mean, is you could do that any time. Uh, this isn't an election year, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, but practicing is, is still something that people could do. You might want to do another practice closer to the election just so mm -hmm. that people remember. Um, but uh, um, I know that um, one of the things that um, people have done. Um, I know Andy Downs from the Down Center has uh, uh, a variety of different uh, historic uh, voting machines that mm -hmm. he's just collected personally. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he's gone to uh, student groups and uh, mm -hmm. different schools and that sort of thing and given a, a, a talk uh, uh, about, about that. So, you know, certainly um, that, that kind of thing could uh, be incorporated into any kind of a group gathering mm -hmm. of, uh, of people that were just interested in having uh, some kind of a presentation. I think that's a really good idea. And one, th one thing that a lot of people with disabilities find helpful are absentee ballots. Yeah. If you have a disability or if you are at least 65 years old, you are eligible to apply for an absentee ballot. You can do that again at indianavoters.com. And that's, ex that's a good accessibility feature for a lot of people, but it's still not guaranteed. Around 12% uh, around of people with disabilities still have trouble with absentee ballots, usually the, because of the font, that the font's too small. So if you apply for an absentee ballot, make sure you've got a magnifying glass handy too. And, yeah. uh, but that's, that's helpful for, for a lot of people. 
Uh, another another issue that we found, um, if you look at the actual if you look at the actual voting figures, people with disabilities are around six percent less likely to vote than the typical population, and but if you only compare the people that are employed, that difference disappears. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we found uh, that suggests kind of the income, uh, social connections and influence and being part of the community, things like that, it all influences your likelihood to vote. You know, the more social opportunities you have, the more opportunity you have to hear about political news, to communicate with other people. Oh, did you hear about this issue or this candidate, you know, that you should support? That, that encourages more people to vote. Yeah. yeah, you're more, feel more connected with the community. Um, also, probably it also has to do with access to transportation. Ah. If, you, if you look at figures across the total population, the higher income people have, uh, the more likely they are to vote. And uh, when people make $10,000 a year, around 12% of people say, well, I couldn't vote because of transportation issues. Right. If you look at people that make $40,000 a year or over, that's only about 1%. So access to, access to transportation, that's a very, very important uh, factor in how often people vote and whether or not they get out there and vote. Right. Well, I know that's one of the things, um, uh, not going to happen this year, but in uh, the previous years, the um, CityLink, the bus company, mm -hmm. has um, uh, gotten a grant from um, the AWS Foundation mm -hmm. to help subsidize Free Fair Day on Election Day. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. To help make sure that the people um, can get to the polls. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that said, um, there's the polls still need to be um, accessible by public mm -hmm. transit. And so um, CityLink had put together a, uh, I think it's up on their website actually, um, put together a uh, list of the polls that were available, that were accessible um, by the bus routes and gave some information about how far you would have to walk mm -hmm. um, or, and, and that sort of thing. Obviously some of the polling stations are outside of the service area of the yeah. of the of the bus route um and those were indicated as well that there just wasn't mm -hmm. service there um but it, i was impressed actually in looking through that list how many um polling places were accessible basically if it was if it was you know within the city limits and and you know i think that they i i, I hope that um, <laughs> when they were choosing um, polling places, they thought ab about that in advance, mm -hmm. that, you know, is this on a bus route? Um, so I think there was some effort to try and make sure that that would, would work. Um, the public transit system also has, for people uh, who are eligible, a um, a door-to-door -door service that can take people. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that would be another situation where people who would be normally traveling to work or to mm -hmm. activities or that sort of thing could certainly schedule a ride uh, to the polls um, mm -hmm. as part of that day um, for free. And and if you if disability issues are important to you, uh, you can always talk to your friends, your family members, people with disabilities that you know, and seniors who may have difficulty walking or moving around. You know, make sure people have a ride. Right. You know, if. If you want to change the statistic, this 6% statistic for people with disabilities, just asking people, can I take you to the polls? That does a lot. Right, right. Well, and I know parties also, um, both the mm -hmm. Democrat and the Republican Party, um, have uh, rides to the poll options that are available. Uh, if, if somebody needs a ride, they can always check in with uh, uh, the party of their choice. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they've got resources to help people get there. Um, there's also early voting. Uh, oh, yes. And definitely. we can talk a little bit about that. That's another thing that um, has been in the news lately. I think it was in Indianapolis. There was some controversy about um, the, the early voting sites um, where, mm -hmm. th where they were located and, and how that um, affected the, um, voter participation. Um, somebody had studied that a little bit, and there was, some, I think, some um, interest in trying to uh, reduce those options and, mm -hmm. and, you know, whether that was politically motivated or not. So there's, you know, those, there is, there's that. Uh, I know here 
Um, the early voting sites uh, were at the libraries, a lot mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's been some conversation about that, too, here locally, whether that is, uh, you know, whether that worked out well for people or not, or should, you know, should they be someplace else? Should there be as many of them? So that's another thing that needs to be, you know, because this is an off year, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a conversation that, you know, that can take place now mm -hmm. in advance of, of uh, um, the next election uh, to make sure that, um, that those options are uh, fully um, explored um, and, and are, um, you know, those decisions are made um, with everyone's best interest in mind. And it, it seems to be, looking at national news, it seems to be a frequent target for funding cuts and they get moved around or they get reduced. And so, you know, again, this being an off year, it's a good idea to, you know, see if you can see if you can Google around and find the early voting site that's the closest to you and the most convenient for you to use. Yeah, and then maybe make sure that it's there nec in next year. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That they haven't done away with it. Because it can um, change. Yeah, because it can change. That's right. Um, so let's see. Um, well, we've given people a lot of information already, um, and I, we, I think we've already talked a little bit about uh, where you can go to get more information, but let's just focus on that for the kind of the rest of the segment sure. that we have on, um, you, know, w you know, maybe we've piqued your interest in something <laughs> that, you know, they're like, oh, I never thought about that before. Mm -hmm. um, or, oh, wow, that's, that's, you know, that's an issue that uh, really needs some attention. Oh, I know one of the, th the other things that I wanted to mention that Doug mentioned earlier when we were um, talking about what we were going to talk about um, was the idea of getting involved at the early stages of, of any um, legislation or any mm -hmm. ruling or an administrative uh, decision that kind of can be made, you know, finding out about it after the fact and, and then suing people about it or whatever because you didn't like it is um, <laughs> not nearly as effective as participating in the conversation at, at the front end mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, maybe they have the opportunity to take your um, uh, 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 advice um, hmm. into consideration before they've even um, made the rule, um, and I think that's that is wise. That is very wise, um, and uh, it, it's challenging to get in on the ground floor sometimes mm -hmm. because a lot of rules get made, um, you know, kind of I don't know whatever behind closed doors by guys smoking cigars or whatever. <laughs> however that works, but um, a lot of times there is opportunity for public uh, comment. And the public does not comment. Yes. Um, and I think that, um, you know, one of the things the League of Women Voters really um, is good at is uh, making sure that um, that the word is spread, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, that, hey, this is coming up. And, and you, you know, you kind of have to pay attention. I know a lot of people sort of zone out on things, but, um, you know, this is something that you sort of have to be watchful um, about. And, and um, you know, it might not be something that you see on Facebook. You right. might, <laughs> you know, it could be on the League of Women Voters Facebook page where you saw this information. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a soundbite, um, or something, you know, really isn't probably enough information. You really have to do a little digging mm -hmm. to, to, to find out what, um, how to really impact at the, at the early stages. So, okay. yeah, let's talk a little about that. So in terms of impact, obviously voting is, is important. It's very important. Uh, you have slightly more impact, or you will have slightly more impact in off years like 2008. You know, a lot of people, they think, well, off years aren't important, but when you do go out and vote, that just means you, your voice is heard louder, you know, when you make that chance and, or when you make that trip, you know, down to the polls, your voice is louder. And one way to make sure that your voice is heard very, very loudly and will get listened to is to participate in the regulatory process. So after the election happens and after the politicians get in 
and they they vote for a new bill, they run a new bill through and make it into a law. Then you have the regulations, and the regulations are the rules that spell out exactly how this new law is going to work. And so let's say Congress passes a law that says uh, we're going to ban high fructose corn syrup from food. The organizations like the FDA, federal organizations like the FDA, they would have to spell out in regulations, well, this is what high fructose, high fructose corn syrup is. This is the foods that it's not allowed to be in. This is the penalty. If you break this law, they have to spell out all of those rules. And when, when these regulations are starting to be written, the uh, official journal of regulatory work of the federal government is, uh, is uh, the Federal Register. And when these new regulations are put up for public comment, they are posted at regulations.gov. And people from the public can go onto regulations.gov. They can fill out a real simple form and say, well, this is how I feel about this. This is how this particular issue impacts me. Some, sometimes the uh, what's called a notice of public rulemaking, sometimes the notice will specify, we need to hear from this subset of people. If it's regulations about captioning, for example, they might want to hear from, well, we want to hear from people that own movie theaters. How, how would this captioning regulation affect you? We want to hear from people who are deaf, who need captioning. You know, how would this regulation Im impact you? Sometimes it's anybody, anybody who has anything they want to say about it. We want to hear from everybody in the whole country. And like I said, this is a way to have your voice heard loud and proud because even when it's a regulation that impacts the whole country, hardly anybody comments. Almost no one compared to the num millions of voters and the hundreds of thousands of people that write their legislature, uh, hardly anyone comments. And so it's a very important thing to do, especially when it's you know an issue that impacts you, like if you're deaf and it's a, a caption regulation or if you ride public transit and it's you know regulations about public transit, you want to make sure to follow up on these things and have your voice heard. Uh, typically, the typically the notice of, pu of uh, public rulemaking it has kind of a summary of the bill and the regulations, and so it it might take you a while to read through, but it's it's worthwhile. And if you sign up for uh, Fifth Freedom Alerts at fifthfreedom.org. Uh, I'll send out a lot of notices of public rulemaking, and I kind of summarize the summary for yeah. people so it's even quicker to read and get an idea of, well, this is what this is about. So you can read a summary of a summary and kind of get an idea of how this might, might impact you, how it might impact your loved ones, and why you should speak right. out about it. All right. As a recipient of Doug's um, emails, I will, I will say that um, you... Uh, you don't get in inundated with absolutely every notice of proposed rulemaking. Yeah, <laughs> he does. He does some filtering, and uh, mm -hmm. and I appreciate that. Um, and 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 provides a little bit of background information usually too, so you can kind of tell whether this is something that, it, you know, right away from just the heading, whether this is something that's going to impact you or not. Right. Um, and you can certainly ignore them. Um, the other thing is, is that um, when you sign up for those alerts. Um, you can identify which particular interest areas you you have, mm -hmm. um, and um, and and they're they're sort of geographically sometimes as well. So mm -hmm. that if it's something that's only going to affect Indianapolis, you don't necessarily get it here in Fort Wayne. Um, but I really have enjoyed getting those. There's also lots of other organizations that will do the same kind of thing mm -hmm. for different topics that you're interested in. So um, if uh, if environmental concerns are particularly important to you, there's the Who's Your Environmental Council that would mm -hmm. do that kind of thing. If there's, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, if you're involved in state organizations or, or any kind of organization, um, you probably have seen um, them post f to you um, some kind of an alert saying, hey, this is coming up, this is an opportunity. And the organization itself will likely um, uh, respond to uh, um, on behalf of the organization. Um, so you know if you're if you're interested, you know if if uh, if it's something that affects environmental issues, certainly who's your environmental council will will 
post something uh, to mm-hmm. the Federal Register that, from their perspective, probably. Um, so, you know, to get kind of double coverage, then you can mm-hmm. also, as an individual, um, also give your perspective. Or, or if, you know, the organization doesn't necessarily reflect your opinion, you can give your own opinion too. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. you either get double coverage or you get your own specific thing. But yeah, Um, and that's what, you know, I think uh, uh, legislators say um, too, is that very seldom um, do they get reasoned, written uh, responses to Mm -hmm. their inquiries you know if they'll send out a newsletter or something like that or, mm-hmm. or a, you know the, or a survey or something very seldom do they get um, a, a lot of feedback mm-hmm. and and being able to um, you know clearly respond in, in to a particular individual request for information um, is uh, is huge uh, it makes a big difference I think definitely and if you if you are contacting your your legislator directly, I mean, there's it's so valuable to do that. Like she said, it doesn't they don't get a lot of feedback, but make sure they know who you are, what bill you're talking about. Um, make sure they know you know if you're that you're one of their constituents. Right. Give your it, address. Yeah. If mm-hmm. you represent a larger organization, you know if you're. If you are in charge of, you know, a nonprofit or a social advocacy organization connected, you know, make sure they know that you're speaking for more than just you and share your issue. You know, try to do that all in one sentence first and say, <laughs> you know, I'm writing to you about the Let's Buy Everyone a Pony Act. Oh, and I want that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or you might say, I oppose it because I don't want to clean up after a horse. So, all right. You know, state your bill, who you are and your position all in one sentence and then expand upon it. Right, right. Because they're busy people. Yeah, they're very, they're very busy um, people. But yeah, I, I know that, uh, you know, when I have, have done that, uh, written to my legislators, their, their staff reads them mm-hmm. and they forward them on. I mean, they, those, those actually get uh, distributed. Um, and, and I think they carry a lot more weight than, mm-hmm. um, you know, signing a petition or sure. even sending a Facebook post or, or whatever. I mean, I th- you know, tweeting. Um, you know, I think, you know, the art art of, and I, when we say written, it doesn't have to be handwritten mm-hmm. necessarily, but I think a letter that is emailed or, mm-hmm. or mailed um, is, is a good idea. Uh, well, we're running out of time, so let's make sure that we get these um, uh, resources in. I'll, I'll, I'll do mine first because I'm I'm here. I'm hosting. No, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so indianavoters.com, big one. Uh, the League of Women Voters also has a website called 911.com that gives you um, connectivity to a lot of other um, uh, voter registration and election um, information. You know, as Doug said, uh, notice uh, the ability to contact uh, your legislators, how to get mm-hmm. those addresses, that contact information, um, and uh, lists of who, who your um, folks are. If you don't know who, who your representatives are, there's a look-up option. So you can just put in your zip code and it'll tell you. Uh, League of Women Voters Fort Wayne um, has uh, their own website. It's lwvfw.org. The State League has a website. The National League has a website. Mm-hmm. You, you can go and look up, up different information, and there's links to that. We have a Facebook page and email alerts that we can send out. Um, and then um, let's talk a little bit about what free, Fifth Freedom resources have. Okay, great. Uh, Fifth Freedom, our official website is fifthfreedom.org, F-I-F-T-H, freedom.org. And from there, you can sign up for our disability news alerts. You can learn about legislation and you know regulatory changes that are coming down the pike. You can learn about um, you know events and fundraisers for various charities around the state. You can personalize things just for your area or just for your you know your particular disability issue or senior issues or veteran issues that are important to you. Uh, we also run indianapop.org, indianapop.org, which is the state's largest directory of disability resources. So really anything you want to know disability from, from infant care to senior law, from allergies to x-rays, <laughs> all over the state, it's all there. You can find out 
where resources are near you, um, autism therapy, special education, you know, anything you might be looking for. Hey, how do I do this? Who do I talk to about this? It's all there. And it's, it's really easy. It's quick to look up. Um, and if you have trouble finding what you need, you can go there and you can contact Fifth Freedom staff and get, you know, personalized assistance. We'll tell you, you know, who you need to talk to to find the services you need for help. Fantastic. And with that, we're out of time for this show. So join us again next month. We run on the second and fourth Wednesdays at 7 o'clock p.m. And uh, you can find us also um, on our website, lwvfw.org. We, uh, you can find all this show and past shows uh, for your listening pleasure. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next month.